I first saw Michaela standing upright and silent in the back of a classroom while a group of male soldiers told stories about fighting in the Iraq war. Struck by her youth and posture, I asked if she had been a soldier too. Oh yes, she said, I was a gunner. Every night I was shot at. But when I say I was in a war, nobody believes me. And you know why? Because I'm a female. But what was it like being a woman in combat, I asked. She looked at me. Well, she said, the first thing you've got to understand is that if you're a girl in the military, the guys only let you be one of three things. A bitch, a whore, or a dyke. You're a bitch if you won't sleep with them. You're a whore if you've got even one boyfriend. And you're a dyke if they don't like you. So you can't win. Yeah, said a young woman who was standing beside her. That's how it was for me. I was shocked. At the time, I knew nothing about soldiers, but I did know that more American women had served in Iraq than in any war since World War II, and that many had been wounded, had lost limbs, and some had even been killed. Could what these young women were telling me be true? And if so, what did that say about the progress of women in my country in general? I decided to find out. So I spent the next three years traveling the US, listening to some 40 women who had served in Iraq or Afghanistan. I learned a lot from them. I learned about endurance and resilience and terrible suffering. But I also learned about courage. Some of the women I met told me they were proud of their service. Others were not. But almost all echoed Michaela's words and told me they had felt painfully alone in Iraq because they were so outnumbered by men. My company consisted of 1,500 men and only 18 women, one told me. I was fresh meat to the hungry men there. The mortar rounds that came in daily did less damage to me than the men who shared my food. Sadly, her experience was not unusual. At the time, some 90% of women in the US military were reporting being sexually harassed while serving, and between a quarter and a third said they were raped, not by the enemy, but by the men on their own side. Were sexual persecution considered a disease, these rates would be an epidemic. And even though the military has been instigating reforms lately, these, these numbers have not decreased. This isn't only an American problem. Canada, Britain, France, Italy, South Korea, Israel have all reported sexual assault of women in their militaries. And women are not the only targets. In the US, some 2% of men in the military are also sexually assaulted, usually by groups of other men or of someone of a higher rank. The reason men rape men is the same reason men rape women. Not out of out-of-control lust, as is commonly assumed, but as a way to degrade, humiliate, and terrorize. Yes, there are uh, rapists who are sexual sadists, but by far the most are venting rage and resentment or trying to punish people they see as threats or outsiders. The same is true of sexual harassment and bullying in the military, which is why military assailants tend to target those who have traditionally been considered outliers. Women, anyone who's not white, men they see as weak or gay, and lately, Muslims. Let me talk a minute about military culture. There is probably no institution that gives ordinary people so much power over others as the military, with its chain of command structure and insistence on unquestioning obedience. Unfortunately, this leads easily to abuse. Last July, the New York Times revealed that certain drill sergeants in the US Marine Corps were treating their recruits so badly, 
so cruelly, tormenting them, torturing and beating them that several died and some committed suicide. Yet had those recruits tried to fight back or report the attacks, they probably would have been made to suffer even more. This tradition of blind obedience and extreme punishment exists to some extent in all the military branches, officer academies included, because it's seen as a way to build a disciplined fighting force. But when it's combined with the misogyny so deeply embedded in military culture, it creates an atmosphere ripe for sexual persecution and rape. Of course, sexual predation exists in civilian life, too. But there are differences in the military that in many ways make it worse. Your comrades could your, or your, your superiors could be insulting you all day long, mocking you, threatening you, grabbing you, but you can never escape them to go home to the comfort of friends and family. You have to live with these people 24 hours a day for months, sometimes even for years. The same is true even if you've been sexually assaulted. A sexual assault can feel like an attempted murder, and indeed assailants do often threaten to kill or maim their victims. But in the military, you might have to live with that assailant day and night and even obey his every order if he's your superior in rank, all the while afraid that he might attack you again. And then, because a soldier is supposed to be able to defend herself and never complain, even if you do report the abuse, you are likely to be treated as weak, a failure, a liar and a snitch, to be betrayed to be blamed and ostracized, and maybe even punished. Victim blaming and retaliation are so rife in the US military that an average of 80% of victims never report the assaults at all. Moreover, because you've been trained to see your comrades as family, the trauma of an assault is exacerbated by a devastating sense of betrayal and the knowledge that the very people who are supposed to watch your back in battle are threatening you instead. This might be why a woman who's been sexually assaulted in the US military is six times more likely to kill herself than any other veterans. It is not only military women who suffer this sort of retribution for trying to be equal to men. Women have almost always been punished when they first enter all male domains. You might know women firefighters or women police officers or others who are facing this now. And look at the scandals to have come out of the Silicon Valley recently about the way women are being treated in the tech industry. Back when women first sought the vote, it was not unusual for them to be imprisoned, beaten, fired from jobs, sometimes even forced to, be, to give up their children. The story of women's fight for equality is the story of the fight for civil rights against a resistant power all over the world. That is why I see military women today as fighting for sexual equality for us all. They have gone to the most extreme citadel of maleness, the military with its age-old macho traditions and said, I am taking my place, not behind you, not beneath you, but beside you. And more and more, women are succeeding. Men are accepting this and things are evening out. But resistance from some in the Citadel remains strong. Only two years ago, Human Rights Watch released statistics showing that a woman who reports a sexual assault in the US military is 12 times more likely to be punished than a man who commits one. Six out of 10 women who reported assaults were retaliated against, and one out of three was pushed out of the military altogether. Meanwhile, not one of those retaliators will even face charges, and the conviction rate for rape in the US military has been actually declining. 
At this point, you might well wonder why a woman would want to join the military at all. If women are treated this badly, you may well be thinking, maybe they should just stay out. But women are treated badly in civilian life, too. In the US, domestic violence is the leading cause of injury to women. But we can't expect half the world's population to hide itself away. No. Misogyny is not the fault of a woman, and she should not be punished for it. It is the fault of men who have yet to face up to reality. Speaking of reality, over the years, I've heard a lot of objections to women joining the military. Look, I confess I've made some myself. But they all depend on stereotypes stuck in the past. Some of those stereotypes are sentimental. A woman is built to nurture, not fight, and is better suited to promoting peace than war. This is appealing, but it's not true of all women. Some of the stereotypes are insulting. Women are too physically weak and emotionally volatile to depend upon in a crisis. Well, military women and world leaders have long proven that one false. Some of the stereotypes are absurd. Women will ruin the camaraderie of all male units, and chivalry will make men more inclined to, to protect women in a battle than to fight. I find this last one particularly laughable in the light of the most unchivalrous rates of sexual assault in the military. These were the same sorts of arguments that were used to prevent women from voting, from inheriting property, from choosing their own destinies, from going to university, from becoming doctors or scientists, politicians or presidents. And every one of these arguments has been proven specious. No, a woman should be able to choose for herself who and what to be. Certainly not all women are suited to the military, but then nor are all men. That is a decision that should be up to the individual, not you or me or a bunch of old boys in the government. With this in mind, I have a suggestion. To measure how women are doing in your country, take a look at how your military is treating them. Do they have the same job opportunities as men? How many women hold the highest ranks? What are the rates of sexual assault and harassment in your military, and what is your military doing about it? Are women even allowed in your military at all? And if not, why not? Now, take a look at the women you know. At school, at work, at home, among your friends. Are they being held back from opportunities? Can they speak up about their rights? Are they listened to with the same respect as men? Are they paid and promoted at the same rates as men? And if you're a woman, are you? And if not, what are you going to do about it? You don't have to be in the military to fight for what's right. Remember Michaela standing so silently in the back of that classroom? She didn't stay silent for long. She spoke out on behalf of military women, not only to me for my book, but on television. And now she holds an important job in government, helping veterans. And this brings me to my earlier point about courage. A lot of the women I met are fighting back now. They've overcome the self-blame and shame they learned in the military, and are speaking out about sexual assault and discrimination to help others and demand reform. But this entails taking risks, because military whistleblowers are seen by many as disloyal or even traitorous. These women know better. Some have joined lawsuits, some have testified to Congress, some have appeared in documentaries, and some have written books. After all, a soldier's courage doesn't have to be defined by saving or killing people on a battlefield. It can be the kind of courage it takes to speak out against injustice even in the face of threats. 
And that is the kind of courage we can all use, military and civilian alike. That is the kind of courage that gives us hope. Thank you.